Hi, my name is Bianca and I am a second year PhD student at Columbia University. But a few short years ago, I was an A+, 100% S tier level at graduate school application. Rejections! That's not where you thought that sentence was gonna go, right? With a 3.71 GPA, two summer research internships, two full-time research uh, in a well-respected academic lab, two years in a biotech company, and six publications at both medium and high-impact journals, many would expect that I would get into at least one PhD program, if not most of them. My application was pretty stacked, at least in my opinion. But after what felt like an eternity later, little baby Bianca is crouched in the veto position for days on end because she got no interviews, just crickets. For anyone caught up on Jujutsu Kaisen, yes, I know locusts aren't crickets, but that same is just too good to not include. Was my SOP subpar? Too wordy and convoluted? Did I poorly explain my research goals? Was I too unqualified even with six publications and so many hours spent on research? I don't know why I didn't get in that application cycle, and unfortunately, I will never know why. But I worked with my mentors to identify my weaknesses and turn them into strengths. And two years later, I applied again and got into Columbia's Neuroscience PhD program, which is a freaking amazing school. So how did I go from 10 out of 10 rejections to an Ivy League PhD acceptance? Beats me. I have no idea. Okay, that's only partially a joke. Even if I can't give a 10-step list that will guarantee a Columbia acceptance, what I can do is share what I wished I knew when I was applying for PhD programs. Hopefully I can give some encouragement and tips to carry you through this nerve-wracking time. And although I can't help with writing statements, since you'll definitely be submitted by the time that I release this video, Maybe I can convince you to not check Grad Cafe or r slash grad admissions, whatever you do. I wish I had listened to my own advice two short years ago. Is it just me or do grad students literally do anything besides working on their thesis because your brain just feels like mush right now? Like the perfect level of old mushy banana that you would use to make a lovely banana bread. My brain is a mushy banana. Now it's time for a grad school secret. Regardless of how hard you work on your application or how qualified you are, admissions can still be a crapshoot. My former mentor once told me about her own application cycle where she got accepted into Washington University at St. Louis, which is a top neuroscience PhD program, but she got rejected from a guaranteed safety school, and nowadays no program can be considered a safety school, which is quite unfortunate. There is an element of luck to grad school admissions. Worst news, there will continue to be an element of luck as you apply for grants, publish papers, or just exist in academia. And the realization that both scientific excellence and luck are pretty much required to succeed nowadays hit me pretty harshly as I was applying for grants a few months ago. I spent so many sleepless nights crafting a research proposal that was not only scientifically exciting and revolutionary in the field, but also technically sound, which is quite difficult. I edited final draft version 3-BTC edit dash final dash final final dozens of times after feedback from my PI, other professors, and my lab members. And looking back, my first drafts were definitely like Gucci levels, Gucci garbage levels of trash. Let me know if you want to see a critique of my first draft and show everything that's wrong with it because that would be pretty embarrassing for me but maybe quite informative for you. But in brief, I stuck a crap ton of scientific jargon in it in the hopes that people would think I was knowledgeable about my topic as opposed to completely lost and incompetent. Over time, it did get better, especially since I read through tons of literature relating to my proposal. Go figure, intelligent, intelligible, ah. Intelligible scientific writing starts from actually understanding your topic. But at the peak of my stress, my postdoc pulled me aside and reminded me of this fact. Write something that you're incredibly proud of, but at the end of the day, your grant may be first in the stack or last in the stack of papers read that day. Your reviewer could have had 
have the best day or the worst day, and that may reflect in your grading. Be proud of your best, but if it doesn't pan out, that's not a reflection of your scientific ability. And that's the main sentiment that I want to convey to all of you grad school hopefuls. Work hard on the things that you can control, but try not to be too upset about the things that you can't control. That's easier said than done, I know. You can be the best molecular biologist, but if MIT took too many students last year, your chances are lower this year. Did the number of applications skyrocket because of talks about an economic recession? Your chances of admission are lower. All of these factors would be completely unknown to you as you're scrolling through university websites and making your application tier list. Things I wish I knew when applying for PhD programs from an old and decrepit second year PhD student. If you don't get in the cycle, it's not a reflection of your scientific ability. Because there's an element of luck, regardless of how qualified you are, admissions can still be a crapshoot. And it's totally okay to apply multiple times. My first cycle, I got rejected everywhere. My second cycle, I got into two top 10 neuroscience PhD programs, including Columbia University. Keep writing and rewriting your statement of purpose. Emphasize different aspects of your personal and scientific story. SOPs are not resumes, but rather Rather, they take the readers through select experiences that reveal the most impactful snippets of who you are as a scientist. 1,000 words cannot fully convey your motivations, your passions, approaches to research, and how well suited you are to be a graduate student. So be creative with different stories and narrative structures. Start early, like much earlier than you expect. Don't submit your application at 11.59 p.m. on November 30th like me. Point number three is pretty self-explanatory, I would hope. So so I'll focus on point number two for the remainder of the video. And I promise I won't be as long-witted as the first point. Statement of purposes, the embodiment of hell on earth for a STEM student trying to apply for a graduate school. You must simultaneously sell yourself as the next Nobel Prize winner and show instances of humility and collaboration so that other researchers will actually want to work with you. You have to prove to the school that you fit their criteria of a perfect graduate student, even though there is absolutely no way you can figure out what that means. But that's just SOPs, right? Once you get into grad school, you can leave all the aneurysm-inducing convoluted writing aside, right? Well, let me burst that bubble for you real quick. As you get higher up on the academic ladder, you'll need to keep convincing people that you alone are uniquely qualified to do the field transforming work that you are proposing. Journal editors, manuscript reviewers, grant committees, fellowship boards, these are all people that will judge whether or not you're worth it based on how well you communicate your research and how well you sell yourself. Graduate school applications are typically a STEM student first foray into this type of academic writing. You would think that undergrad would teach us how to convince other people to actually care about our work, but I was a STEM major. All I did was learn biology, regurgitate it for my exams, and then promptly forget everything. But given that, it makes sense that most of us, if not all of us, have no idea how to write a good SOP. So if you're having a hard time writing, then close your eyes, take a deep breath, and don't worry. All of us have stayed at our screens for more than two hours, trying and failing to write a single sentence. And if you haven't, you're lying. <laughs> It'll take time to figure out our writing style. It'll take time to learn how to communicate really, really complicated scientific concepts to people that aren't necessarily experts in your field. I mean, think about it. If you're working in a research lab, you've probably only talked about your research to either lab members or to collaborators, aka people that are experts in your field. Maybe you've told your friends or family members about your research, but those are people that probably have no scientific knowledge whatsoever. So throughout your research career, you've probably only talked science to experts or to lay people. But with your statement of purpose, now there is an entirely new audience. Experts in a field of science, but probably not your field of science. And that's an incredibly challenging
challenging audience to communicate to. To a friend or a family member, you'll just state what's the most important thing and simplify it as much as you can. To a lab member, you can speak in field-specific jargon and be lax on the clarifications because you both know what's going on. To admissions committee member, you need to simplify your research to its key components without misrepresenting the complexity of the system, but also emphasizing the aspects that make it novel, innovative, and an incredibly exciting scientific premise. PhD 101, scientific communication shifts depending on your audience. So there's this protein in the brain named Hal that can get really, really sticky in patients with Alzheimer's disease. And over time, it clumps up together, kind of like a little snowball, and that can cause neurons to die. So we're gonna stay in for AT8 and ThiOS and APP, RTG4510, and the APP, RTG4510 cross to see if amyloid beta deposition increases the abundance and conformational stability of tau aggregates. Does our tau knockdown therapeutic strategy still work in these crossed animals? AD is far more complex than one intrinsically disordered protein. The patients I hope to treat also presented with extracellular amyloid beta plaques. Preliminary data that I collected revealed that amyloid beta deposition can alter the biochemical activity and the conformational states of marine tau aggregates. Will this confounding variable of amyloid beta deposition impede the efficacy of common town knockdown therapeutic strategies. In each of these statements, I'm technically conveying the same scientific concepts, although I removed the complexity of multiple disease proteins in the example of talking to your friend. But as my audience shifts, so does my approach to conveying my science. When I'm casually talking with a lab member, we all know which transgenic models we're using. We know which antibodies are standard across our field. Even if there's a specific tool or concept that we're not not familiar with yet, because it's within our field of study or adjacent to our field, it's actually pretty easy to pick up. Therefore, we can use the scientific jargon, and we should use specific names when we're talking about which proteins, which RNA, or post-translational modifications, etc. that we're studying. It helps everyone in the lab understand the precise question that you're trying to answer with your personal research. But when you're trying to explain your research to an admissions committee, to a grant reviewer, or another scientist that you may want to collaborate with, you have to remember two things. One, they're an expert in a field of science and two, that field of science is probably not your field of science. So how do you communicate your research with them? Think about the core concepts of your work. What are the basic mechanisms or pathways at play? And even if your readers don't know about tau or amyloid beta, they probably know something about proteins in normal or disease contexts. Or for a less mechanistic approach, they probably know the basic therapeutic approaches for Alzheimer's disease. So bring up a scientific concept only if it's necessary. Unless it's basic science that any expert from any field will understand, you'll have to explain what it is and why it matters. And no one wants to read an SFP or a grant where 70% of the writing is explaining the background necessary to understand the rest of the proposal. So when thinking about your own work, do this little exercise that my PI told me to do during my grant season. You're probably working on so many projects or maybe your project has multiple components. You can't talk about them all. So pick one that has the most interesting scientific story. Write down the overarching hypothesis of that story and list only the things that are absolutely necessary to explain the hypothesis. Then cut it down even more because, you know, people like us are not gonna follow instructions. You may think that simplifying your science like that will completely remove all the nuance and complexity. It'll make your research feel bland. But in reality, it's a skill to synthesize complicated data into a simple and coherent story. That's what writing manuscripts are all about. Here is a groundbreaking narrative that completely changes the field. And here's all the complicated little pieces of data that collectively support the story. By emphasizing a unified story that is easy to follow, people can spend more time admiring your insane figures as opposed to figuring out what the hell your science question is. And a coherent story will also help you emphasize why. Showing reviewers that you can accomplish innovative research is important, but discussing the implications of your research are arguably more important. How do you get people to care about your research? Write about your work with the following questions in mind. What is a major problem in your field? What are the gaps that have not been answered by you or other groups? 
What are the specific steps that you'll take to resolve that gap? How is your approach novel? How are you, your proposal, or your lab uniquely suited to accomplish this work? And if you structure your scientific writing like that, at least in the beginning, you'll slowly learn what is integral to include and what can be left out. Your writing will become more concise and will emphasize exactly what you want to convey. And with that, I think I've been rambling for way too long. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. And let me know what the things you wish you knew before applying to PhD programs are. Maybe I'll make a part two where I combine our collective knowledge and make a video that is definitely more comprehensive but until next time be kind to yourself and remember to eat and drink some water because all of us lab rats are perpetually dehydrated